Hi, everybody. Um, we have an absolutely fantastic panel this afternoon of some great innovators who are delivering next generation solutions based on WSO2 technology. And so actually, because we want to spend as much time as possible with them, I'm just going to introduce them right now and we'll get right started. Uh, joining us from WSO2 is our own Asanka Abasinghe, who is the Vice President of Solutions Architecture. <laughs> Asanka. <laughs> and joining us also is Prakash Iyer. He is the Vice President of Software Architecture and Strategy for Trimble. Uh, joining us next is Senthil Kumran, who is Vice President of Engineering Commerce Enablement at Verifone. And our, our last and uh, certainly not least panelist here is Ron Murphy. Uh, he is the principal member of the technical staff at eBay. All right, so um, the first thing, we want to start with a little introduction. And the fact is, each one of you has been building a platform that fosters innovation either internally or that extends out to partners and customers. So um, can you each begin with a little bit of an explanation about uh, your initiative that you've been doing? And then, Asaka, maybe uh, you can then share with us some of the uh, work that you've been doing with WSO2 customers. So, Ron, would you like to begin? Sure. Uh, so, eBay uh, has a pretty large platform staff. We love to do things on our own. We may even be a little too addicted to doing things on our own. Uh, we have a, a rich and interesting relationship with WSO2. We'll uh, collab you know, collaborate at times. We'll go off and do our own thing at times and then we'll kind of reconvert. We've actually been working with WSO2 for about 10 years. Um, most recently, uh, we're a big user of the Enterprise Service Bus product. We use it for layer seven routing internally to eBay. Uh, all the calls from mobile for eBay come in as service calls, and those all go through an Enterprise Service Bus. And uh, this represents about half of eBay's traffic currently, maybe a little more. So it's actually a huge volume uh, situation. What we work, wanted to do the last couple years is um, uh, improve the ESB platform, and then kind of simultaneously with that, we were trying to improve our load balancer platform. We really want to move towards software-based load balancing. So we did some experimentation with Netty with uh, revised load balancing algorithms. Um, that that um, there was a lot of research connected to that, a lot of, a lot of uh, investigation of specific dispatching techniques that would be appropriate for better, uh, more responsive uh, load balancing. Uh, and that, that project kind of seamlessly meshed with an effort to build out a next-gen ESB. And during this time, we were talking with WSO2, as we figured out what we wanted more, we would you know, express that to WSO2. Um, we wound, where we are now is we have uh, an in-house platform based on Camel, and amazing coincidence, WSO2 has just announced their platform, which is also based internally on Camel and some other functionality. So at this point, you know, we're kind of uh, dancing back and forth and, you know, do you want to be my girlfriend or not? It's been a great <laughs> uh, experience throughout, and, you know, I just have to say we've really appreciated the collaboration uh, many points during the, the years. I could, I could say more, but let me hand it on. Um. Verifone, I don't know how many of you have uh, heard of Verifone. Uh, it's, it's a brand that you probably come uh, in contact with almost every day, but you probably don't realize that it's one of those brands. So we are a payments technology provider, so uh, the payment terminals on which you make uh, payments for your everyday transaction, uh, in all likelihood, with 70% probability, is a Verifone payment terminal, right? Um, so 
as a company, we have been trying to reinvent ourselves, you know, innovate and help our partners and application providers innovate. Um, uh, you know, this space is such that uh, security is the underlying, uh, you know, core of everything that we do, right? And sometimes, uh, you know, I think security stands in the, uh, in the way of innovation, right? Um, so we have, uh, most recently, and this is about a year back, we uh, engaged with WSO2 and we are uh, already using uh, both the identity server product as well as the uh, ESP the solution. And, and uh, the whole idea uh, around what we are doing uh, is about commerce enablement and connected devices. So we have, uh, believe it or not, we have millions of payment terminals out there. And uh, what we are marching towards is uh, essentially enabling our application providers and third party um, you know, developers to be able to develop non-payment applications to run at uh, the point of, uh, point of presence. Uh, at the, at, on, on the terminals. Um, so in order for us to do that, uh, essentially from a load perspective, we are talking about um, millions of uh, devices going through a system that e essentially enables these uh, non-payment apps to uh, you know, communicate with their backend services. And um, WSO2 is the backbone that's uh, essentially powering that. And uh, so a, a, a simple example is when you go shopping and you use your credit card for a payment transaction, um, wouldn't it be nice if uh, you know, the punch card isn't an actual paper punch card that someone is handing you with a punch, you know, on the punch card, but rather it's based on your credit card that it already keeps track of how many visits you have had at the coffee shop, right? And, and those are the types of applications, innovations that we are enabling at the, pay, uh, at the, at the payment terminal. So, um, you know, I, I think what we are trying to do is enable innovation by innovating ourselves on, on the terminal, and, and we hope to see a lot from that. Um, yeah, I think this is good. Um, so at this stage, normally I start by asking how many of you have heard of Trumbull? Um, and this time I'm not going to do it because with this light coming at me, I can see, I cannot see anything beyond this first row. <laughs> so the good thing about that is, even if you guys all walk out, we'll still be talking here. <laughs> <laughs> None of us can see anything. Um, but anyway, so uh, if you haven't heard, Trimble is uh, of Trimble. Uh, we are about um, uh, $2.5 billion uh, publicly traded company, 30 years old, started here in the valley in, uh, in Sunnyvale. Uh, with a global presence now um, over, I mean, pretty much anywhere uh, there's a Caterpillar vehicle, you'll, you will see Trumbull some way or the other. Um, so what, what do we do? We, we, um, we collect, of course, the names such as um, position. Uh, we collect position and various sensor data um, from vehicles, from the farm field, from the construction field. Uh, from uh, you know various telematics uh, devices, uh, use a myriad of communication technology to build solutions that are vertically focused, uh, market focused. Uh, in other words, if you define that's IoT in the enterprise, uh, so we are the the uh, enterprise IoT company, uh, and our association with uh, WSO2 started I think way back in 2007. Uh, we also started with ESB uh, in our telematics platform. Um, but in about, uh, you know, whatever, seven, eight years, uh, we have now since built an entire uh, underlying PaaS platform based on WSO2. So all of our uh, new cloud solutions and transform solutions uh, run on the, uh, uh, the platform we call uh, TPaaS, which underneath that uses a lot of WSO2 technology. Yeah, so it's a bit of a, a difficult question for me to answer because uh, we have an entire platform with 25 plus products, as well as uh, cu various customers using the products to build different type of solutions. Uh, so, but what uh, we see basically simple integration solutions to simple security solutions into more kind of uh, strategic um, digital transformation, connected business type of large solutions are building. Uh, so the, what we see today, more and more kind of platforms building, like uh, integration platform, IoT platform, uh, or um, 
big data platform, and then providing middleware as a service for internal consumers as well as uh, external consumers. So that's what we see uh, from a small project that most of the organizations are moving uh, towards that path and then provide it as a service for their consumers. Great. Well, I think with innovation today, I think we all know that it looks a lot different than it did years ago. And so what I'd really love to hear from all of you is how have the technology uh, requirements that you face today evolved to address the demands of today's innovation? Oh, uh, sure. So. Uh Innovation in some ways is easier than ever. Uh, culturally, it's really being encouraged. eBay has Skunk Works constantly, uh, many different Skunk Works uh, uh, sessions internally. Uh, software is richer. You know, you have cloud, de cloud deployment. Um, you have so many frameworks, including WSO2, to work with. Um, I think what's challenging, what's uh, changed about the landscape is the complexity and the kind of, um, it's the productization phase of innovating that's really difficult. And uh, we've been through this multiple times. Um, making software secure, making software scalable, uh, highly available, manageable. Um, having it be, you know, easy to understand and work with. Um, one of the challenges right now, actually, is there are so many languages. And uh, I work in a frameworks area. Um, we have a challenge of how do we glue together all the different uh, stacks and how do we operationalize stacks? If somebody writes one set of code in Scala, another set of code in Node, um, you know, how do you stitch that together? Uh, and we're actually looking increasingly to microservices strategy for that. That's actually one of the things we talked with WSO2 about. But those are just some of the things off the top of my head. I'll let the rest of the folks talk. Yeah. Um, I think we are getting lazier and lazier as the number of years. Like, uh, I mean, five years from what it was like five years back to what it is now. I think, uh, you know, um, we are animals of convenience, right? And then we want everything. You know, I mean, we are now lazy to take the credit card out of our wallet. We want to have it on the phone. We want to use our mobile phone for, for everything. So I think from an innovation perspective, what we saw like five years ago was mostly incremental innovation. So basically taking an existing product and then uh, building a better mousetrap, right? So essentially, you know, let's, uh, let's have, you know, larger screens or let's do this or let's do that. But um, I think in the last few years, uh, lots of things have changed. There's been huge disruption especially in the payment space. In the payment space, there have been companies like Braintree, of course, now it's PayPal, but uh, there is a Square, you know, which, which did, uh, you know, so many, um, what you call, wonderful things for those small business owners, right? Uh, the long tail merchants, uh, as we call them. Uh, so your, uh, you know, fitness trainer, the personal fitness trainer who can actually use your credit card for accepting payments, right? So, uh, very phone being an incumbent in the space. I mean, we are a 30-year-old company, you know, similar to uh, Trimble, I guess, and uh, pr pretty much the same size. We are, to, you know, market cap of close to five billion, whatever that is, right? Um, so from an innovation perspective, it's very different to what it was five years ago. We really have to be more disruptive in what we do. We really have to, um, you know, if you look at Apple Pay and Google Pay and all of those things, um, we are essentially enabling those types of payments uh, at brick and mortar, right? But it needs to go beyond that, right? Because um, essentially, as I said, people want more and more convenience. They want to do everything using their mobile phone, not just payments, but even non-payments. And that's what you know, uh, commerce enablement, what, what my division does is all about, and uh, that's what increasingly we are going to be using uh, all the backbone and the infrastructure that we are building. Um, so I, I kind of take a look at this in a slightly different way, which is more a strategic way of what innovation is. I, everybody has a definition of innovation. So um, to me it is, how do, you, how do you take an idea to value? Everybody has ideas. Uh, ideas are, are plenty. But how do you take that into value, something that is tangible, something that really um, affects your bottom line? So um, uh, five years ago or uh, a while ago, 
um, we, we could afford to focus on a number of things and being, um, as, as you pointed out, incremental innovation. Um, but now we are in an environment that is um, disruptive, not just disruptive, fast-paced disruptive. Uh, and so it's not only um, uh, companies like Trimble or uh, Verifon have to focus on innovating to catch up, also innovating to get ahead. So how do you do that? How do you focus on where you innovate and where you leave it to someone else to innovate? So, uh, for example, in our case, uh, 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 connecting directly to WSO2. So that's what we decided. Um, we didn't want to go and build... Uh, an identity system. We didn't want to build an API manager. We didn't want to go and build an ESB engine, uh, which probably we would have done uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but we would rely on people like WSO2 and other open sources, and then focus on the kind of things, and I don't know how many of you got a chance to uh, um, uh, listen to uh, Greg Best from Trumbull, who presented an amazing array of technologies where a tractor is you know, uh, doing the entire farm with without the farmer even touching the steering wheel. And uh, those, so we want to focus on those kind of innovations and, and the, the market solution that we take to the customer and, and rely on things like uh, WSO2 uh, to kind of help us get there. Uh, so what I see uh, is the, uh, we have a proper environment now to uh, be innovative and then uh, to handle the complex business problems as well as to do quick releases. So uh, from the architecture side, basically we have really good architecture practices. Like even we did talk about this iterative architecture that how you can build stuff iteratively and then that will help if fails, uh, like identify it quickly and then correct it and move forward. So that's from the architecture side. And then from the technology side, as Ron mentioned, like things are getting more simplified and then things are getting more lean uh, and lightweight. Like if you uh, take an example, if you take it from the uh, wire level protocol side, like we used to use JMS, AMQP, now we have simple stuff like MQTT. And then from SOAP, uh, uh, SOAP and XML side, we have like lightweight, like a JSON and HTTP type of technologies. Not only that, even the, uh, the uh, deployment side from the hypervisor-based heavy virtualization, now we have like lightweight Docker, uh, Kubernetes, those type of technologies. So I think from the technology side, we have all the ingredients to uh, face the and be innovative as well as uh, uh, quickly release our solutions and then uh, match the uh, business demand and the demand coming from the business side. Can I, can I add something to what Prakash said? I think he kind of nailed it, right? Because that's really the bottom line, right? Which is we have no, I mean, five years ago, we probably want to build everything from scratch, like not invented here mentality was there. And now we don't have the room to do that, right? We have to build things really fast. And <clears throat> like uh, an example is our commerce platform that we have built. I mean, if we didn't have the underlying blocks to kind of build it, uh, essentially going from initiation of the product to essentially being ready in about eight months, that's really difficult to do if you are trying to do everything on our own, right? So essentially it's selecting those blocks and building so that we can innovate in our own space rather than having to worry about the underlying uh, building blocks. I think I can add one more, like this platform approach also help because uh, when you build a platform, you provide some set of uh, foundation services as APIs. So that will reduce the number of uh, like development cycles that you need to do to develop application. So that's another thing that we see with this uh, platform approach. Well, speaking of platforms, uh, you know, I think all of you today are using the cloud for some aspect of the solutions that you deliver. And, you know, there are a lot of options out there, whether you do public cloud for certain things, where you do a private pass. And if you do a private pass, um, do, you, do you do it all yourself? Or are there benefits to doing a managed cloud type of solution? And I'd love to get your thoughts on the decisions that you've made at each of your organizations. Yeah, this is a really interesting topic. Um, eBay is on its third generation of cloud technology now. Uh, the first one was called Newton. The second one, interestingly, was called Stratus, uh, as opposed to Stratos. Uh, and now we are on what we call C3, which is an OpenStack-based cloud. 
Um, we, all of these we've developed in-house. I think we were fairly early in the curve uh, starting on our own internal cloud offering around 2006, I believe it was. Um, it's, uh, we've seen the industry grow and standardize, and we're very aligned with that. Uh, we are tracking the development of Kubernetes and Docker. Uh, probably will have functionality headed in that direction within a couple years. Uh, in fact, there's, there's work underway now. Uh, eBay has chosen not to do public uh, cloud. Actually, we have one service that does live in the cloud today, which uh, the public cloud, which is uh, image processing, because it's advantageous for that to live close to the consumer and its commodity. You know, it's a, there's no massive data. If you think about eBay, uh, I think we have uh, something like a billion listings. So it's just not cost effective to, you know, have all that data live in the cloud. And the, the data, you know, kind of tends to bring a whole string of infrastructure with it. I think what we'll see is more niche deployments into the cloud where that's appropriate for a given use case like image processing. Um, cost is always a primary factor for us. I think as you grow and scale, uh, it'll become a cost factor for, for anyone. Yeah, <laughs> Verifone, it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a strange animal in the sense that we have a mix of both our own data centers and, you know, private, you know, data centers as well as public cloud. Um, and it's, uh, the decisions are driven by things like security and compliance, right? And of course, customer comfort factor, right? Because uh, we have payment gateways that, uh, you know, process hundreds of millions of transactions every month for our customers and uh, uh, customers you know obviously don't want that to sit in a public cloud and so the decisions that drive it the primary ones are you know customer comfort level and uh, security and compliance uh, but at the same time you know uh, there are a number of services and products that Verifone has that i would say are non-payment uh, services and uh, you know, in those type of scenarios, we don't have, uh, you know, we essentially are moving towards a public cloud, right? So uh, more and more of the applications that we are building where security is not a gating factor, we are moving them to uh, public cloud. And um, there are definitely advantages of moving to the public cloud. I can tell you that with our own infrastructure, there are uh, probably, I mean, although we have a footprint, I mean, and a, a fairly big footprint in terms of our data center, and also a blueprint that we follow for setting up our data centers. Um, still, um, the ability to kind of uh, move fast is much better when you are in the public cloud, just because there's been a lot of, uh, there are a lot of tools and there's been a lot of innovation around the tools that live in the public clouds. And uh, unfortunately, that doesn't always find its way into the private cloud uh, infrastructure space. So. I think we have a big mix of both, and uh, personally, I'm a big fan of public clouds, right? Because uh, you know, um, the engineers never complain about, hey, it takes me two weeks to get a virtual machine, right? Because they go and do whatever they want, and you know, essentially things seem to move faster. Yeah, so I think in our case, it's very similar to um, very from we have both private and public um, cloud applications in production now. Uh, and we started this cloud, which was then never called cloud. It was called hosting service or hosted application service. Um, and, and we built that. We built that uh, pretty much all around the world. Actually, we had our own, our own stack um, because we, had a, um, we have two big joint ventures with Caterpillar. And, and one of them actually uh, mandated us to have these hosting centers um, available in, in different regions, uh, geographic regions. Uh, so we did that. We did that, um, and, and we scaled it nicely, and it worked well. Uh, but then as the, the public cloud uh, phenomenon emerged, uh, we wanted to make sure we could take advantage of that, because the, the pace of innovation happening there, as I said, is so, uh, you know, an order of magnitude faster than anything that you could do in, on your own. Um, in fact, I, you know, a number of our guys went to uh, uh, the Amazon conference. They all came back and said, we should move everything into uh, public cloud now. Uh, because that's the pace at which it's moving. But, but the important thing for us, uh, again, strategically, what we decided was we would build our pass layer in such a way that we would still maintain a level of independence from any of the actual infrastructure layers of cloud. So the, so the T-Pass built on WSO2, uh, we, that, that could build application that runs on uh, our own private cloud as well as on the public cloud. So 
that's, that, that was a, a key decision for us. And Asaka, I know that you're actually seeing some broad trends across multiple customers. Yeah, so the, uh, what uh, we see basically public cloud is uh, good for one uh, category like small to medium businesses who got uh, simple uh, problems to uh, uh, solve because uh, when it goes to a public cloud there are a lot of limitations even you get a tenant that uh, you will have limitations if you have a lot of customization then it will be really hard to do uh, so that's the uh, main issue uh, but what we see mainly uh, publicly hosted private cloud or a privately hosted uh, private cloud. That's the most uh, uh, popular thing that uh, we see. Then uh, that particular organization can build exactly what they want, as example, the TPAS. Uh, so uh, it's uh, a private cloud hosted in a public uh, uh, infrastructure. So that's uh, what we see. Managed cloud comes in a different angle because it's who manage and operate the cloud. Uh, it's very popular today because uh, most of the organizations either they don't have the enough capabilities to run a cloud or they don't have uh, enough time to invest to uh, build a cloud and then put the applications into production. So what we see, like there's a lot of interest uh, to get a managed cloud and then at some point uh, hand over the operations to an internal uh, DevOps team. So uh, that's uh, ex what we see from most of the uh, organizations. So um, one of the things that I, I think it, we've heard as a theme in some of the talks um, over the last couple of days is that the most successful enterprise IT teams uh, when they're driving innovation is they're thinking global, but they're acting local. That is to say they, are, they have a major plan in place and an architecture um, that is thinking in the long view, but that they execute incrementally to show success. And, and I know that each one of you has done that and would love to hear about your experiences. Yeah. Prakash, would you like, or? Um, okay, um, so uh, our CEO, um, Steve Berglund, used to say this in every, management meeting, always, you know, uh, act local, think global. Um, uh, that was the sort of mantra for everybody, um, how we do this. Um, and and we, have, we have done that in, in, uh, in, in businesses, in, in the way we acquired technologies, because Trimble has grown through a lot through acquisitions. And uh, in all of those acquisitions, the reason for that is, you know, how do we actually um, pr deliver a uh, business solution that is pertaining to that specific market, um, whether that is a telematic solution, whether that is uh, a construction solution or ag solution. Um, but but what you need to do is to be able to bring in the the scale and and the depth of technology that you have globally uh, to to take the the best uh, advantage of everything that comes from that specific market. Uh, and again, um, our strategy has been to go with. Um, the, the, the PaaS platform, and as we acquire technologies, bring them on board and have them migrate and, and run them on our PaaS platform. Yeah, <clears throat> I think it's uh, pretty similar for Verifone. I think global is actually now becoming more and more local, if you really look at it. Um, you know, so Verifone, when we make our payment terminals, which is our you know, underlying technology that enables anything else, services that we build and deploy on top of it. Um, we make the terminals to be like, I mean, we always keep the global aspect of it in, in mind, but uh, generally what happens is the market needs are different, right, globally, right? I mean, if you go from, I mean, for just giving an example, I mean, in China, like if you look at the payment terminals, what wins is a really a certain set of features that that market is asking for, which is maybe a lower cost terminal, right? Uh, the ability to do you know various 
things uh, on those terminals, and that may not entirely be true for the U.S. market, right? Um, in the U.S. market, what the big driver for us now is EMV. As you know, now you have your chip cards, and you guys have to, you know, insert your chip cards now. So that's a driver, right? So it kind of varies from, you know, country to country, but generally when we build products, it's, uh, it's based on specific demands that we see in certain markets, and so therefore we usually start local, in those markets, right, and for those markets, but with a view towards globalizing that product, right? And that's how we have always, uh, you know, kind of uh, moved our products. Um, there are some category of products where we have to actually build it global, right? So we can't think local because the moment you think local, then you get tied to local, unfortunately, so. Uh, I think the, the best projects or the technology efforts uh, start kind of grassroots and, and uh, grow over time. This was one of the questions I said I wouldn't go into much detail on. But uh, just real quickly, uh, my very first assignment at eBay 12 years ago was writing a service call in .NET from C++ to Java. Somebody wrote a server on the Java side, and we were trying to accomplish a transition from C++ technology to Java. Fast forward two years, and we did our first serious service call where the eBay billing functionality, which was still written in C++, we wanted to be able to call out to that instead of having it be local in the process. And that, that was our, that, thank God it succeeded, because <laughs> um, we would have had a lot of problems otherwise. And then fast forward uh, one or two more years, and um, my eBay, the, the homepage of, of eBay, uh, it's actually homepage, uh, started doing service calls to draw content. And that snowballed. You know, we started doing fairly serious services, then we started doing mission critical services, and now I think we have something like uh, almost a thousand services. And, uh, it, you know, it's everything, like I said before, everything mobile goes through that. So just start small and keep building up. And actually, on that note, I think, Asaka, from working with multiple companies, you've actually seen some specific best practices for implementing a platform over the long term, but showing early success. Yeah, so it's uh, aligned with the uh, earlier concept that uh, I explained about the iterative architecture. So start small and then get the first project success and learn from that. So with that exercise, we can identify what are the uh, dependencies we have and then whether it's meeting the performance. All these things we can learn and then have a, uh, then go to the next iteration and then implement. So that's, we advise our customers as well. Uh, and then uh, most of uh, the architects uh, in the customer side, they follow the same principles using these uh, agile methodologies and then uh, agile principles. So we call uh, it as an architecture spike in uh, uh, one release and then only thing the architects should uh, con consider the bigger picture as well because whatever the small architecture spikes that you are doing uh, should be uh, fit into the uh, the bigger architecture that uh, you line up so that's uh, the advice that uh, we are providing and most of the projects are running on that way uh, and then that helps to keep on releasing the product uh, pr project uh, as well as do the expansions uh, with that exercise um, <clears throat> one of the things we wanted to do is um, we'll wrap up with one more question up here, but before we do that, we actually want to take a few minutes, turn it over to you in the audience, and see what questions you have for our panel here. You guys, you guys have been using, um, started using microservices, right? So what is the difference that you see um, in comparison to the traditional uh, use of services like web services like SOAP or REST? So what's the difference to see when you implement microservices? Sure, so I think it's uh, sort of a continuation of a trend. You know, I've, I've read some material recently saying there's nothing extremely new about it. It's more about focus. Um, we're interested from two standpoints. One, uh, to abstract out the use of data in eBay. We have really complicated databases and it kind of obstructs development. It interferes with continuous delivery. It interferes with isolation of different concerns. So we felt that uh, wrapping individual tables and services is probably a good trend. And then secondly, for framework use, I mentioned the polyglot problem. 
Uh, we also have a problem of backward compatibility. Those are two drivers. So we have framework. The framework's got a bunch of plug-in things that do tracking for eBay and personalization and you know, logging and, and uh, very, you know, internationalization and all these functions. And those are owned by different teams. So the problem is all these providers, we call them, they um, put something in and our framework bundles that and it's backward incompatible and it messes a couple hundred customers up and they get mad at us, not the provider. So we're trying to find a way to modularize the operation of the framework itself and uh, we see microservices, you know, having a kind of a dispatching framework such as the one that uh, WSO2 is working on could be a way to glue framework level functionality or, you know, um, architectural concerns. Uh, so so, so if I could add a little bit on that, we are, we are trying, trying to um, play the microservices more from a business need. So many of our um, uh, verticals, the applications, have been largely monolithic. Uh, big application. So I give you one example of a, a telematics uh, asset management application. Uh, there are various aspects and various workflows within that application and that are specific to a role within our customer community. Um, so for example, the guy who manages fuel is different and the way you manage fuel, uh, the, may, the way you manage idle speed in a vehicle, the way you manage the unified fleet status, right? Uh, and in, the, in the legacy application, the monolithic application I talked about, it's, it's very hard to be agile in that. You, you have to, when you make a change, you have to go through the whole process of bringing everything together. So one of the things we are doing is breaking those applications into smaller microservices. Uh, and, and so it's very easy for us to deploy these, uh, easy for us to change, easy for us to isolate deployment, whether we want to deploy to a particular user community or, uh, or a particular uh, type of customer community within that application. Uh, so you could kind of react, um, uh, you could be much more nimble in doing that by using microservices, and that's one of the, re the reasons we have uh, started doing that. So actually I didn't believe microservices for a while. I think uh, that's a quality I think I learned from Sanjeev, I think not to believe uh, any new technology <laughs> while working with, for, with him for eight years. Uh, but uh, then we found actually there are some good qualities in microservices as well. Because every organization, uh, most of the organizations are following this podular architecture. There are pods that uh, provide different type of business uh, functionalities. So for that type of an organization, the microservices architecture perfectly fit. And even I uh, did a session in the morning. So basically the, the, uh, the problem, a lot of people think it's about the size, like micro means size. But micro means not the size, it's about the scope how you scope it and then uh, get the responsibility uh, from a specific port and then deliver it. So uh, as uh, I think Ron said, uh, the, it's not nothing new. It's about SOA with the latest technologies that help us to quickly uh, spin up a server and then quickly deliver the stuff. Uh, so it's a combination of the traditional stuff correctly implementing SOA with the new technology. So that's what we find uh, with the uh, uh, microservices architecture. And it's not only about microservices, it's an architecture pattern that it uh, got a lot of stuff like uh, inner architecture and uh, outer architecture. So to correctly implement it, we have to follow the, uh, the, uh, the both uh, sides of the architecture, not only just right set of uh, uh, services uh, with a small scope. I think we have time for one more question, maybe two. Uh, um, so a lot of you are uh, embracing the changes with the new technologies. Um, what are your lessons learned for other organizations who wants to accelerate the changes and uh, increase the adoption of new technologies? Well, uh, it's funny you ask that because uh, part of this load balancer effort that I talked about I was managing that and I feel I made a bunch of mistakes with that project, to be quite honest. Uh, and some of those had to do with execution and with setting expectations. I think innovation is, um, so first of all, who does the innovating? It's like your smartest people, right? And they also are very, you know, their ideas are all over the place, uh, they're, they move very quickly. So it's difficult to have a kind of a, a tracking around that creativity. You kind of have to set small milestones and keep to them. 
The mistake is just watching the work and, oh, that's cool, you know, and it, it's, it's moving along, but you aren't necessarily having proof points, you know, like demos. Um, so I would really recommend that. I would recommend having kind of adult supervision in terms of a project manager or somebody uh, that, that can work with the technology. Um, and I think uh, the, the other, you have to watch out for, there, there's this whole syndrome of, um, you know, it's brilliant, it's complicated, it's buggy. And the, the convergence down to it's solid doesn't seem to ever happen. So what, you know, I recommend early on enforcing a strong unit test discipline, uh, do even test-driven design. Um, th those are, I think that if I had done these two things, strong project management and a test-driven design, we'd probably be in better shape with this particular load balancer effort, even though it is running in our whole feature QA environment. So it's not doing that bad. Um, yeah, I, I think there, are, there were a few lessons learned from our side as well, I mean, at, at very point when we were building the solution. And I think uh, one of the big things is uh, if you pick that wrong technology, as you, I mean, the, the building blocks when you are trying to build your solution, uh, trying to go back and fix it can actually be very costly kind of an exercise, right? And as we were, you know, building or evaluating different building blocks for us to build our solution, um, there have been certain areas where, you know, from an evaluation of or the the fit for of, of that particular building block for what we were exactly doing may may not have, uh, maybe, maybe we didn't put enough attention to that and that kind of hurt us towards the latter part, which uh, is a costly thing, going back and trying to change and removing something and putting it back on. Um, so I, I think spending some time upfront on architecture and properly evaluating the right components when you're building your solution uh, will always, uh, you know, kind of uh, save you a lot of time towards the latter part. I mean, um, it did cost us some time, and, and more than the cost, it's the dollar cost, it's a time cost that you can't live with nowadays, so. Yeah, one more question, maybe. And, yeah, so we, one more question? Yeah. Um, has it not just become a the cheaper and faster way of a try and error pattern? Has it become a cheaper and faster way of a try and error pattern, the whole building blocks approach? A faster and cheaper way of the trial and error pattern in implementing a project, I think. Yeah, I, I wouldn't call it as trial and error pattern, right? I think, uh, you know, trial and error patterns uh, are, again, costly in terms of time and, and money, right? And, uh, you know, I would say building blocks, uh, I would say majority of what we have done, most of what we have done, I've, I've been happy with in terms of how we have evaluated the technology stacks and uh, formed the building blocks to build our solution. Uh, there are some, as I said, uh, if we don't spend up time, uh, upfront time on evaluating the exact fit of that block to our solution, that's where it has become costly. But I wouldn't really call it a trial and error. I would, I would have basically, I would classify it as an oversight and uh, you know, putting certain uh, processes and checks and bounds that makes sure that uh, you know, uh, those things are caught earlier in the phase than, rather than later in the phase. And I would say uh, when you do this, everybody wants it faster and cheaper. Uh, again, going back to what I said earlier, focus on the essentials and, and pick a solid um, platform for the non-essential part of your business. Um, so, so that way you don't have to worry about that layer. So you don't worry about your API manager or your identity server and those kind of things. Uh, pick something that is solid there and then do your, your uh, trial um, and, and iterate, iterative development on your uh, business side of uh, the application. So the answer for the, uh, add to the first question, I think uh, when we do these type of projects, they are sh we have to take a huge risk. So best example is like uh, with Prakash, we had this chat uh, five years back, 
like how to enable these devices sending information and then collect this uh, information and then provide uh, value uh, for the uh, the customers so that time even this iot architecture concept was not there uh, so but when we look at it today it's perfectly matched with the iot concept so we took the risk so i think uh, when we take in the risk if you are having a strong technology relationship with your technology provider I think in this case WSO2. So then that will help to minimize the risk because uh, the everything will not work as the way that uh, we want. So once you have a strong uh, relationship, uh, then you can work with the technology partner and then uh, solve these problems. So I get calls from Prakash around seven, eight. Hey, Asanka, I got this idea. How okay, thank you for the <laughs> tips. Okay, <laughs> now I know I can call you at like seven a.m. in the morning and. All right. Well, with that, um, thank you very much, everybody. We have a great final keynote, so we will wrap up here. And uh, thank you all very much.